Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Day Early Comics Review Show. I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, where every Monday after the comics have arrived and we're done bagging and boarding them, we divide them up and we read the ones that we most uh, just couldn't wait to read <laughs> and the ones that we think people want to hear the most about. Also, there are always a number of number ones every single week, and I just know a lot of people want to hear more about these books. What are they about more than just a little solicitation blurbs? So we do the spoiler light reviews. So I think it's a pretty medium week this week. Yeah. I think each of us is going over 12 comics, so when this video is done, we'll have gone over 24 comics that are all releasing this week. We're also going to show the variants and the incentives. So let's begin. Yeah, beginning with, I, I like that you mentioned the ones we can't wait to read, because when I look over the list of books coming out, I, I like when there's always a couple, I'm like, oh, that's this week? Oh, good, like, stuff I've really been looking forward to, and of course, being a massive Star Wars fan, I couldn't wait for Star Wars Hidden Empire number one. So this is the third, issue one of the third part of Charles Soule's grand uh, I don't know what the, what it's going to be called when it's over. The Crimson yeah, Saga the Crimson or something. Saga, Kira Saga. Yeah, something. starting with War of the Bounty Hunters. Then we had uh, Crimson Rain. And then moving into Hidden Empire. So this is when Kira, uh, Han's previous love interest, but now she's so much more than that. She is the leader of this um, kind of anti-imperial, anti-Sith, hidden rebellion group uh and she is going to make her biggest move on uh palpatine and vader and the whole empire in this one and it's really interesting because she's as it suggests she's had like a hidden empire that has had operatives spread everywhere in the bounty hunters guild in the empire and the rebellion they all got uh kind of activated to cause chaos for the Empire to kind of finally show uh, their true power. And in this, she actually confronts Palpatine, uh, I would say face-to-face, -face, but uh, hologram, hologram to hologram. Yeah, I thought so. And it's revealed what her uh, big plan is. I don't want to give out all the details because I think it's going to be really exciting for people to read. But as before, this is being told to us by the archivist, has been a character that's been in this whole series. In the previous one, we saw that she's from a message relaying to somebody about Kira's story. This one we pull back even further and note that there's two individuals she's telling this to. In the shadows, we don't know who they are, which you can speculate about that. But uh, her big plan is she, uh, if you read the previous uh, Crimson Rain, you see that she has the what's called the Fermata Cage, and it is an ancient Sith artifact that uh, all like it's been talked about is that it has the ability to destroy the Sith. Now you'll have to read it to find out what uh, this means, but it's more than just uh, a weapon. It actually, it does something very uh, dark side related, and you get to watch them as they try to activate this machine to finally show, like, the big grand power that she's been planning. Uh, there's a lot going on in this issue, so I won't give it away, but I will say that because of this Fermata cage, uh, you, not in this issue, but we could be leading up to a either major first appearance or the return of a of a very big character. Uh, I don't even, I can't, I've got speculations about who it could be. I don't know, but it is hinted at what might be happening. So I will, oh, that's all I'll say about that. And it could almost literally be anybody. Uh, once you read it, you'll see. But this does have some first appearances in it. Uh, I say the major one. Uh, and it's just a cameo. It's in the beginning when the archivist is basically recounting to the reader what the last two parts of the story have been about. And talking about when the uh, the kind of hidden agents were activated and the Empire fought back. Uh, we see Iden Versio and the Inferno Squadron. And if you played Star Wars Battlefront, 
that was who the protagonist of the story mode of that game was. A kind of a fan favorite character now of Iden Versio. And so this would be her first cameo, but due to some uh, preview pages put out for the Star Wars Revelations one shot, we see that that's probably going to be her first full appearance, and this will be first cameo of uh, Inferno Squad, led by Iden Versio. Uh, yeah, and then uh, some other just little fun things. We have been waiting, and we even got a name drop in a previous issue that Prince Zizor from Shadows of the Empire fame, the leader of the Black Sun, uh, that he is still the leader of the Black Sun, but we have not seen him in the current continuity, there is a meeting of the heads of all of the crime syndicates, and I believe that he is there, which is pretty cool to finally get a character from one of my favorite games brought in. Uh, it just, I, I don't know, a really fun issue. It does catch you up well on all of the craziness that's been going on, and it definitely looks like it's leading to some really big things, some mysteries that Charles Soule, you can tell, is slowly rolling out. So I'm excited to see his first appearance is going to be, and who the archivist is telling the story to. They even speak, but of course, in the comic, you can't hear a voice. Um, so I feel like that's going to be a big reveal, maybe at the end of this uh, couple issue series. So that is my spoiler light review of Star Wars Hidden Empire. Definitely enjoyed it. I think everybody, if you enjoy Star Wars, needs to be picking that one up. We've got a couple of variants. We have the Connecting variant with Wren of the Knights of Wren. We've got the Shalvi variant, and we were joking about this one because it looks like it fits right into the Marvel uh, blinds. the, blinds, the blinds, variants. blinds variants. It looks like Palpatine and Kira staring at each other from like neighboring hotel rooms. But I believe this is called the Battle variant. And then we have a 1 in 25. This is called the Travel Variant. I guess it just looks like travel posters. This is by Lopez. And we are selling it to our customers for $25. Okay, so the first one I'm going over is Iron Man issue number 25. Legacy County, it's issue number 650. So if that's not enough, it, and this awesome Alex Ross cover isn't enough to make it special, this is the final issue that the creative team is doing on this Iron Man. This is pretty much the end of this volume. So uh, writer Christopher Cantwell has told all the stories he cares to tell. I've enjoyed the run quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the last one for him, an artist, Angel Nzuida. So in this, Iron Man gets an Iron Man day thrown for him. It's just a one-time thing. Like the city council decides, hey, you know, he's done some things for us lately. Let's have Iron Man day. Well, you know, when a writer has to finish a series and it's like, you know, you can't like have a, ha you can't set something up. Mm -hmm. um, that's not very cool to the next creative <laughs> team. The, these last issues tend to be sort of philosophical issues. And that's what this one is. Tony Stark has, to has Iron Man Day Throne and it's all about following him and how he feels about this, how he feels about himself. You know, he has a lot of self-loathing. That's always been a part of Iron Man. And so it's a lot of like being in his head, seeing how he feels that the whole city still does like him even after all the things he's been through, all the things he's done, like even Civil War is brought up. Uh, all the Korvac stuff. Correct. Yeah, all the Korvac stuff of this one. So that, that's what a lot of this is about. But there are three stories in here. Um, in, so in the first story also, as Tony's thinking about this, he tries to save somebody's life, but it doesn't necessarily go real well. And he has to sort of come to grips with, you know, heroes can never save everybody mm -hmm. and that's got to be a really tough thing to their job it doesn't get focused on in comics a lot is the times where they fail to save someone mm -hmm. so um the second story is done by jerry duggan with juan for gary doing the art and surprise surprise they're going to be the new creative team on the next iron man mm -hmm. series which is starting sometime next year so they're they're doing sort of like a little preview mm -hmm. of what they're going to be doing and it, it was a really cool story because it's iron man in juttenheim trying to rescue thor so that's the yeah theme of that and he has very different looking armor in that one i i don't remember the armor i bet it's been used before though i mean i iron mean yeah. has had a lot of different armor so there's a, a really short third story by kurt busek with artist uh, benjamin dewey 
which is a re-representation of an old Iron Man story from Tales of Suspense, issue 126. <laughs> and they kind of do it in a old style, but, you know, with modern mm. coloring and modern inking. So that's sort of everything that's going on in Iron Man issue 25, the final issue for this creative team. And then there is a variant out there, but we either are getting ours late or or maybe they all got taken to pull boxes. I'm not sure, but there is a variant. We don't have it to show you, though. So that's it. I like the... Um... Since they know there's going to be another Iron Man series, that they give you a taste of the creative team for the next one. It's a good way of, if you're reading this one and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to stick around. It's like, well, here's a taste of it. See if you like it. See if you like the look and the feel of it. So I think that's really cool that it kind of gives you a little sampling of what's to come. Yeah, Jerry Duggan is a very good writer, so yes. I'm, I'm looking forward one to One of it. my favorite books this week is by him, so we'll get to that momentarily. But another book I really enjoyed this week is Stargirl, The Lost Children, number one of six. So this is by Jeff Johns, and the art is by Todd Nock. Of course, Stargirl is uh, created by Jeff Johns. It's based on his uh, sister that passed away. So he, he keeps this character very close to him. And you know that when he writes Stargirl, it's, it means a lot. So... What is this one about? This is kind of spinning out of the DC New Golden Age. Uh, of course, Stargirl is uh, a roundabout way related to the Justice Society because her dad was a sidekick. It goes into all that, gives you the history of kind of how she relates back to the Golden Age of superheroes. But this actually begins in 1942, where we're following uh, the superhero TNT and his sidekick, Dynamat. And it's really funny because you're like, why do we care about these? Uh, well, Dynamax is actually telling us the story of uh, used to, there, everyone had a sidekick. And they weren't looked down on. They were partners and how important they were to the main heroes and everything. But what makes uh, TNT and Dynamax important is uh, Dynamax was the first sidekick to lose his his hero basically his hero tnt dies and he's the first one the kind of reality hits them of like hey if we take on these sidekicks there may come a point where everything we have is kind of dropped on their lap and that carries a lot of weight so it's interesting because it builds up this thing and a lot of it pretty familiar with golden age characters i'm like do i know this character or not well, as the title suggests, there are the lost children referring to lost sidekicks of old superheroes. And this kind of comes out of the Stargirl um, summer special. If you remember that one, uh, there was a thing that happened in there where Courtney Whitmore, the Stargirl, kind of had a vision and a voice telling her about these lost children. And so her and Amiko Red Arrow... Uh, go on a quest to try and discover what happened to these lost children. And it's very interesting. Um, I would have to do some deep diving to see if this is the first appearance of any of the kind of named sidekicks. The only one we really follow too much is Dynamax. But I thought this was super fun. If you are on board for this new wave of Golden Age uh, characters at DC, I feel like this is the perfect one to kind of run alongside it because it's kind of exploring the younger characters from that time period and what they meant and what their kind of responsibilities were. Uh, so I thought this was great. This is kind of back to Jeff Johns. Um, I would say more like uplifting. You know, we, we had like Doomsday Clock and uh, all the all the Watchmen stuff and Flashpoint Beyond. This is back to kind of what I remember reading with his like Teen Titans uh, all of that kind of stuff, even his old Stargirl run. So if you are a fan of any of that, check this one out. And we've got a variant for it. This is the Kung variant. Stargirl, The Lost Children, number one. All right, so I read Something is Killing the Children, number 26. So this is just furthering the story, for those of you who have been reading it every month like me. So Erica is still 
um, on the run from the order. You have Putter from the other order who has been hired to track her down. And then there's the new character, Gabby, with sort of uh, the, the bar folk that are sort of her family. They're trying to take care of her. And that's kind of where Erica's hiding out now. Um, so it's a lot more on that, a lot more on how the, the dynamics work with all the characters. Meanwhile, Putter has reached the town, and it looks like she's going to team up with the sheriff. She's trying to turn the sheriff against Erica, um, saying that she is a child killer. Hmm. So, you know, which is exactly what she tries to stop. <laughs> but, you know, she's going to use every weapon or arsenal to track Erica down. So it's not a face-off. It's more of a getting everybody set up where they are issue, mm -hmm. but still enjoyable. So that's generally what's going on in Something's Killing the Children number 26. Mm -hmm. This has some great variants. Yes. So we have the John Boy Myers variant. A lot of action and blood <laughs> yep. right there. We have the Jenny Frizen variant. That's super creepy. So that's, that's Cutter. That is from the other order who is after Erica. Then there is this um, 1 in 25 Rebelka variant. Talk about creepy. Is that a character? Um, Not in this issue, but mm. it, it does look like the monsters they, they go up against. And then here is the 1 per store Deladera virgin variant. We're selling to our customers for $25. Okay, and I've got... Make way for the new Bold Goblin number one. So this is the new miniseries uh, tying in with Amazing Spider-Man going on right now where Norman Osborn, uh, because of the events in the previous run of Spider-Man with Sin Eater, I don't even know how you describe what he did. He got his sin knocked out of him. He took away his sin. Right? <laughs> he took away his sin. Uh, even Spider-Man questions like... Why does that really work? He's pure now. Yeah. So, it really, this I this issue, this book, really focuses on what does that mean? Like, if you get the sin taken away, you know, you're basically like from scratch. Norman Osborn seems to be a good person. This, by the way, does take place after his first appearance uh, in our last issue of Amazing Spider-Man uh, nine oh seven. It was just, I think, this last week. This takes place after that because it references his fight with Bob Goblin and that. Um, a lot of this is what is going on with Norman Osborn in his head uh, because even though he's, you know, pretty much reformed, um, that doesn't eliminate the things that he has done and the guilt that he feels for that. So what's interesting about this is he um, is ha kind of haunted by uh, Green Goblin. Green Goblin appears in the room with him and kind of, you know, is like, you can never really get rid of me. Like, uh, he even mentioned something of like, once your, you know, once your suit is washed and all the stains are taken out of it, is it even worth wearing anymore or something like that? It's very interesting. Uh, you can tell, this is written by uh, Christopher Cantwell, that this is going to be a lot of his, more of Norman Osborn's inner demons. There is fighting in this, there is all that, but definitely... I think we're going to get a lot of answers about can you trust Norman Osborn at this point? Uh, is is there any way he could go back or is there any way he could stay good? Uh, but he's also haunted by uh, one of his most evil things he's ever did. And if you've read Spider-Man for any length of time, you know what that is. The thing that haunts him, haunts Peter Parker. Uh, there's even a scene where he is playing baseball with his uh, grandson, Norman Osborn is, and every time the boy hits the ball, it makes a crack sound, and it parallels with another significant crack sound from Norman Osborn's life that is very disturbing, but it really sets up a interesting um, new take on Norman Osborn, and also we do have the action of him in this uh, going after the new Jack-O-Lantern. So, Pretty cool there. Um, if you've been reading Amazing Spider-Man, this is an easy one to kind of detour off of and read. Uh, it's new reader friendly, especially if you think the suit looks cool, that kind of stuff. But it is, you know, definitely tied in. You're not going to get his origin of why he's good or anything. It does mention the Sin Eater thing, but doesn't go in depth on how he is good now. 
So I still think it's good, uh, new reader friendly. But definitely if you're reading Amazing Spider-Man, this is a great one to pick up. But it was really fun. Got variants for that as well. So we have the Bengal variant, which this has Queen Goblin and Red, is it Red Goblin? Uh, Normie Osborn, is that where you can uh, That one, from the Dan Slot one. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, neither of those characters appear in here, but who knows, they could in the future. I had to clarify They're who it was. the Goblin family. Yeah, I had to clarify who it was, so then I could tell you they're not in it. Uh, and then we have the Marco Cicchetto. See, you got, you got Green Goblin there, he's not too far away. And, to kind of mirror that, we have the Cicchetto Gold Goblin variant. But she does have a really cool suit. And you can see that suit even better here on this 1 in 25 McGinnis design variant that we are selling to our customers for $25. Get a good look at what his suit and glider actually looks like. All right, so a lot of good reads this week. One of my favorites is Nightwing 98. I really enjoyed this issue, <laughs> uh, which is great. This is like a one and done issue too. Yeah which is really cool. You know, they're heading up to issue 100. I'm sure they're going to cook up something real big for next mm -hmm. issue that'll lead into that 100th. This issue, though, has the first full appearance of Night Might. I mean, you see him on the cover. You see all his pair of great moves. He knows how to dance, how to kick, how to do everything. He even knows how to, how to do graffiti on uh, Nightwing's cover. So Night Might is all through this issue. It's so hard to say that name. Okay, Night so Night Might is a character who is more of like a nuisance than anything to Batman who is from the fifth dimension. That's the same dimension that Mixelplex is from. Mm -hmm. Night Might is from there too. And no, it is not Mixelplex in disguise. It's not Bat Might in disguise. This is a new character from mm -hmm. fifth dimension. He has come to um, talk to Nightwing. Because basically, Blockbuster, the villain of the series, he kind of has been taken out lately. And uh, Night Might happens to know that Blockbuster's daughter is now in serious trouble. I'm not going to go into exactly why, but basically, like, we're talking demons coming to drag you to hell trouble. Oh. There, there is a good reason why that is. And he tells Nightwing, all right, uh, you're the only person that can help her. And so Night Might lends Nightwing some extra powers to fight demons. And on top of that, Bitewing, yes, the, the dog Haley also gets superpowers this issue. Wow. Including the ability to speak a little bit. Huh. So, I mean, that's like all the things I've wanted ever since they've introduced this dog is for them to superhero together. And they do. They get to go fight demons in this issue together. So really awesome, real fun issue, real uh, just fast paced and and great, uh, you know that great Redondo art of course. Um, this of course is written by Tom Taylor, who's you know just taken this series and just made it what it is. So the other thing is it does also go even further into Nightwing and Batgirl's relationship. It tries to Night Night might, although he's a good guy, he he's a little bit of a stinker, and he tries to fast forward the relationship even more than they want it fast forwarded to and he even brings other dc characters into this that don't want to be there including the biggest dc character mm -hmm. um, so anyhow great issue if you're not reading nightwing or you're thinking about falling off it get this one first mm -hmm. this this will prove to you why this is a worthy read every single time so uh this is the stealth freeze variant and then we have the Jamal Campbell variant. And lastly, here is the 1 in 25 <laughs> Dan Hip variant. We're selling to our customers for $15. These are all over. That's what happens when you fall asleep around night, Mike. Yeah, I like how they're like, you know, he can be helpful, but they're also kind of little garbage pail kids. Like, they're going to get into some mischief. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the way they go about things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next up is one of my favorite reads this week, the one I referenced earlier by Jerry Duggan. This is Batman One Bad Day, Mr. Freeze. So I'll go ahead and say, I, you know, I've read all of the One Bad Day issues so far. Um, personally, this one has been my favorite. Uh, I know the first one was really big, the Riddler one. Um, you know, your mileage will vary what, which kind of tone of Batman stories fit to you. 
I'll say this one is the closest to like an episode of Batman the Animated Series, which is fitting being about Mr. Freeze and his wife, Nora, considering her like first appearance was in the movie. Um, so, of course, one of the big reasons I like this was the feel of Batman the Animated Series. The art is by uh, Mario Scalera, who brings in a lot of that. I mean, you can tell the Mr. Freeze in this is directly referenced from um, from the animated version of Mr. Freeze. He's got the the red goggles that, like, even when it's all black, you can just see those round circle eyes. Super cool. Um, but what I liked about this is it is uh, a further digging into Mr. Freeze. I've read a lot of Mr. Freeze origins. You know, Scott Snyder brought Nora kind of into the main DC. Very tragic, tragic villain. Yeah. Um, this does something I, have, I haven't really seen before. Uh, and that is kind of retroactively make him a villain again. Uh, and you'll have to read it to completely see why. But this is a Christmas issue, which I love. Really fun. Uh, and Robin, this is Dick Grayson Robin. Uh, after Batman and Robin are out. Other reason I really like this is because the other ones haven't had much Batman. This is mostly Batman. Um, but he, Robin questions him of like, do you think any of the villains can be redeemed? And Batman's like, not really. He's like, I kind of think they're all bad. But he's <laughs> like, but there's one. And that's Mr. Freeze. So uh, Batman goes out because he's got a lead on where Mr. Freeze is. As one of our favorite characters matches Malone. The uh, the skeezy even does some karaoke. Uh, it's it's great, but uh, on this trail to find Mister Freeze, we learn more about what Mister Freeze and Nora's life were like before the accident that turned them both. One when he had to protect Nora by freezing her, and he became Mister Freeze. Uh, that I don't want to give too much away, but maybe. He didn't want to be frozen. And maybe it was more of him being selfish. Mm. It's a very complex story that I thought was incredibly well done. Um, if, you know, it's a one and done story, but one of my highest recommendations of this week. Uh, I will say there is possibly a first appearance in it. Mr. Freeze has a sidekick in this uh, called Frostbite. Right. Now, if you look at DC... There has been like a hundred characters named Frostbite. That's not, you know, that's if you're looking for a cold themed character, that's a pretty good one. But uh, this is a female Frostbite, and there hasn't really been one of those in association with Mr. Freeze and all that. So process of elimination, I believe this is a new character. Named I, th Frostbite. I think it would be great if they had uh, sharp teeth made of ice, you know, and that's their Frostbite. You know? Yeah, they, they like get a little more you. literal with it. <laughs> then their teeth melt every time. They're putting new. Ice dentures. Uh, but, yeah, I could keep going on and on about this issue, but I really liked it. It was just kind of that nice, uh, you know, almost feeling like a more mature uh, issue of Batman Adventures. You know, something like that. Uh, even Batman has the circle bat symbol, everything, the yellow and black. It just all felt nostalgic, but a little bit more um, adult-themed in Mr. Freeze's origin. So that is... One Bad Day, Mr. Freeze. I say, yeah, if you haven't picked up any of these One Bad Day issues yet, but, uh, you know, this sounded interesting, get it, because they're all one-shots. It's it's super easy to jump into. And then we also have the Jim Lee variant. Very cool. I see his pain and torment in that <laughs> Jim Lee variant. Okay, so, Gert is back. I Hate Fairyland has a new issue number one. This was one of Scotty Young's first creator-made series. Mm -hmm. um, they even joke about it at the beginning of this. It, it kind of jokes about the creator of Fairyland went off to write all these other crappy books. And now he's <laughs> back to doing what uh, he should have been doing all along. So there's our main character, Gert, on here. Who? Uh, and So what happened in the previous series is that she was a little girl. She wished to go to Fairyland. She went to Fairyland, and she was stuck there for 30 years. So she's like... 30-something-year-old character truck, stuck in a little girl's body wanting to get out of this fluffy, cutesy world. And she fought her way out. She did make it out of Fairyland. Very so, 
Oh, yes. Very violently and with a lot of great humor. <laughs> so uh, this, of course, again, is written by creator Scotty Young. The interior art is done by Brett Bean, which the art is just fantastic. Like The story is good, made me laugh a lot, but the art is also just really memorable. It's sort of a cross between like Disney Don Blue style mixed with Fract and Mad Magazine. <laughs> it's like if you could yeah. apply those two, that's, that's the art in here. So in this story, Gert is working at a fast food establishment. She has found it very hard to make it in the regular world because all her skills are killing and attacking. You know, <laughs> when people annoy her, she just fantasizes about doing that. That's what she did her whole life. Um, so after a series of job losses due to accidents and problems, she hits rock bottom. She is like near dying in an alley and a mysterious benefactor comes for her with an offer for a job. Now, I'm not going to tell you what that job is, but if she takes it, she will have to go back to Fairyland, the thing she never wanted to do, but she really needs this job. So you get your kind of setup in this issue. It's great. It's awesome. Uh, if you never read the last one, it's fine. You can just totally get into this. Um, I mean, Scotty Young, I'd say the fans he had when he wrote the original to now, it's probably, he probably has at least 10 times as many fans. Yeah. So uh, don't be afraid if you're a Scotty Young fan and you didn't read the first. Go pick it up in trade. Mm -hmm. But you can go ahead and grab this now and start reading it. It was. It was I wouldn't it was really say it's good. like story heavy. It's more about the like just the gags the along humor, the way, the characters and the situations they are currently in. Yeah, that is a good way to say it. So yeah, I'm I'm so glad Scotty Young's in comics. He just brings a different edge. Yeah. than a lot of other people, and not just with his art style, but his writing style too. So we got a lot of really good variants for this. Here is the Maduera variant. A lot of artists want to show their idea uh -huh. of, of Gert. Here is the Art Germ variant. This looks so sinister. Here is the Momoko variant. That's about as nice as she's ever looked. Yeah. But Jenny Frizen variant here, this, this takes it the other way. Yeah, that one's great. She gets insulted uh, by a lot of the fast food people who are in line. They call her like a, a messed up garbage pail kid, and it, it's pretty funny. So, and weren't there some incentives for that? Where did those go? You lost them. There is also the uh, expletive one. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. Okay, yeah. so yeah, there is another variant for it, but it has a four letter word that I cannot put on the screen or YouTube will zap our video down. Yeah. So you can look for that one in your store. <laughs> but it looks very similar to the A cover. Okay, next up is one I've been interested in uh, about what is this about and kind of the format of it and everything. This is Murder World Avengers, if that title doesn't get us flagged also. Uh, <laughs> Murder World Avengers is going to be a series of one-shots um, that are exploring arcade the x-men villain arcades murder world uh which is where and a lot of the old x-men books he would send the x-men and it was kind of like a, a death carnival yep. just kind of a crazy thing He's, if, if you played the marvel ultimate alliance games yes you've been the murder world um so this is written by jim zub and ray fox and in this one uh, i feel like it's a little bit deceiving with the title of murder world avengers uh, because we actually follow in this a new character named Paul Pastor. And he is your, um, I almost said typical. No, he's he's more likable than your typical uh, YouTube personality. Uh, he's, he's outgoing. He said, you know, he started off doing like toy unboxings and uh, streams and all of that. But as he grew and grew, he started to give some of the money he made to charity. And that helped him grow even more. Uh, and then he started to get into urban legends and debunking myths. And that is where what has led him to this uh, urban legend of Murder World, which uh, is supposedly this thing that just thinks Squid Games. The way it's done in here is like 200 contestants go in. They got to make it through. One's going to walk out with the money at the end. And you know, it's, it's basically the Squid Game idea. But when, uh, on his birthday... Paul Pastor gets a present, and we opens it up. It is a message from Arcade saying, Hey, I'm actually a fan of yours, and I would like you to come to Murder World 
and actually do a documentary about what's going on here. And so everybody's like, dude, you have to do it. Like he posted a video of him unboxing that and his his viewers like tripled and just keep going up. He's like, I have to do it. So you are seeing this idea of murder world through the eyes of a kind of amateur amateur documentarian. Uh, very interesting. Uh, but when they get there, it's called Murder World Avengers, but the Avengers are not there to save people. They may be part of Murder World. So uh, if that's not horrifying enough, uh, this book is very, it's teen plus, but I would say it's like, I would still be a little cautious because this is deceivingly adult with the amount of violence and just shocking moments to uh, I can I can almost assure you will not see the ending of this one coming. Uh, it goes from surprise to another surprise that's just crazy. Uh, but we do know the next uh, part of this is going to be Murder World Spider-Man. So uh, it even teases a little bit of that in here. And it seems like there's going to be a thread through all of these. We don't get in here, but it's teased at the end that Black Widow is actually... Uh, going to be trying to il infiltrate mm -hmm. Murder World and stop it. We, so we don't get her in here, but there is kind of a letter at the end that talks about that and shows you some black and white panels from upcoming issues. So I thought this was really interesting, not for kids, uh, but if you kind of like that mix of, you know, uh, Battle Royale, Hunger Games, Squid Games, all of that, but with some Marvel flavor tossed in there, you will definitely like this. So that is Murder World Avengers, number one. Just a one-shot, so let your store know if you want to be on all of the Murder World storylines. Yeah, and I happen to read there are five of them total. Okay, five. Yeah. yeah. So what was the first one? Was X-Men? No, this is the first. Uh, yeah, Avengers, that's the first one. And then okay. we have Spider-Man, and I think I know there's a Wolverine one. Uh, there's a Moon Knight one. It does. It lists them in the back of this, now that I'm remembering. There, I know there's a Moon Knight, uh, Spider-Man, and a few others. Uh, we've got some variants for this. This is Paul Pastor on the cover here. This is the uh, Lionel Francis U variant. And then, of course, we got to have this Sinister Arcade cover by Scotty Young. Yes. Corin, that's ketchup on the world. Okay, so I read Blade Vampire Nation. So this is just a one shot, even though it has number one. Don't look for issue number two. It's a one done. I feel like this story is a little late. And the reason I say this is it was a while back. It was uh, right at the end of Heroes Reborn that Blade was made the sheriff of the vampire nation of Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, all the vampires live in Chernobyl. Dracula is the head one. And they made a deal with the Avengers that they would help in the Heroes Reborn arc. Or Actually, it was at the end of King and Black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they made a deal that they would help against um, Null, and in return, the Avengers are like, okay, well, we'll rec we will recognize your vampire nation, but you have to let Blade be your sheriff. Which, of course, Blade was thrilled to do, hanging out with vampires all the time and not actually able to kill them. He has to be the sheriff of them. Yeah, he doesn't like that. So I'm really surprised that this is coming out now instead of way back then, because I mean that was such a good situation they set up. Well, anyway, it took a little while, but it is here. This is from uh, writer Mark Russell with art by Dave Watcher. And so basically what happens in this is Dracula goes to Blade and he says, hey, um, there's some sort of revolution bubbling up here and it's going to be bad for business. It's going to just be bad for my country. I really want to try to make this vampire nation work. And because lately somebody tried to assassinate Dracula and they killed, um, I think, a member of the vampire council. So this truly is a detective story. I mean, it's almost straight out noir mixed with vampirism. It is Blade going around through the seedy underbelly and political world of all the vampires of Chernobyl. He is questioning people. He's trying to find out who would do this. He's calling people out on their lies. I mean, if you're looking for him just like fighting with his sword, that's actually not a lot of this. This, this really is more of him being a detective trying to figure out what's going on. It's a very political issue, if anything, mm -hmm. like vampire politics, that is. You know, them trying to run, run this nation. 
So if that sounds like it's up your alley, I would check out Blade Vampire Nation. It's just a one shot. By the end, you will see who is behind it all. You will understand who's behind it all. Um, so I, it's pretty pretty interesting read. And so past that, we have variants. We have the Lozano variant, and we have the Inhyuk Lee variant. Is this like, does it say, you know, to be continued? Yeah, follow Blade's story in. No, it, it, like it didn't say that. Okay. So I feel like they're just trying to keep uh, Blade active yeah, uh, as they lead up to that new series with his daughter. Yeah, his daughter, that. right. That, that and is just, probably why they finally broke that out. Yeah, he's a great character. I'm glad he's finally coming back out into the light. Okay, so next up I have. Uh, I believe this is our last one shot from Dark Crisis. This is Dark Crisis. I guess it'd be Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, World Without a Justice League Batman, also starring Zatanna. I was, so, I was surprised they released the Batman one last. Like, I was it, too. You know, usually Batman's first, but I think this time they're like, well, people will definitely stick around to read yeah. the Batman one. Yeah, it's very interesting that they picked this for last because it, there's no real reason why it should be last other than. Uh, no, the only. W- Part that ties back in with the main one is the Zatanna backup story. So, uh, this is written by Simon Spurrier, and art is by Ryan Sook, which is, I mean, Ryan Sook's art is phenomenal, so this is a beautiful book. Um, but what is Batman's uh, kind of, not idealized, but like a world centered around him? Uh, as you can imagine, it's still pretty messed up. Uh, Batman has a lot of demons that he faces and even in a in a kind of a constructed place to hold him uh it it's still needs a batman but uh in this it is a world that has been destroyed by um this psychic storm that happened and there's one city that remains and that is gotham and it is a kind of a utopia city uh, that is run by a, a new character called Mr. Wax. And so what is Mr. Wax? He wears like a weird mask that's got like goggles. And he says it's just so he can go out at night and get a drink and no one's going to bug him. But he has designed Gotham to work like uh, clockwork. Like, you know, people kind of, they go to work, they do all their stuff, and it all runs smoothly. But at night... Uh, there are some not so great places, and that is where the character, the knight, spelled N I G H T, uh, has to protect them. And that is the character that's on the cover, who is kind of your Batman like character in here. And in this, there is uh, some weird stuff going on, as you can imagine, in a world set up like this. And it is up to the knight and Mr. Wax to team up, uh, and they have to um, figure out they. When this psychic storm happened, people lost part of their memory. And they are kind of trying to piece that back together. And they team up to go to a place that uh, is only, it's kind of off the maps. And it's called Ark. So if you can imagine what that actually is. The sign is, it looks like there should be more letters going across it. But it's called Ark. Uh, This is I would say probably the most ambitious of these one shots. I mean, it feels like Spurrier sets up like a world that's like probably see more in this. It's such a different take on Batman and Gotham that it's almost a new thing. Like there's even question, is the knight real or is he like an automaton? Is he a clockwork? Um, have to read it and see. Very cool. And then the backup story is... About Zatanna, but this version of Zatanna is basically the person who create, created the universe by speaking the words backwards. Uh, and it delves a little bit into um, the multiple realities, the, the multiverse, what she's kind of looked like through all of the different ones. You have your classic Zatanna, you have your New 52 one, all the way back to kind of your 80s Zatanna. Very interesting. It feels like that's Probably the part that most pushes the Dark Crisis storyline that is leading into the final issue of Dark Crisis. So I definitely recommend picking this one up. I could see 
versions of these characters being brought out of here and put into the main continuity just because they're a very weird and complex character. So that is, well, Dark Crisis Batman. I won't say the full title, but very cool. And we have a variant for that. This is the Ryan Sook variant. You get a lot of the pieces of the story in that one. Okay, so I read Chroma number one. This is a new indie book coming out this week by Lorenzo De Felici. Uh, Felici De Felici did the cover, the interiors, everything, the writing. This is just a single person doing all the stuff. This is a really ambitious work. So for one thing, this is over 40 pages long. And so it costs a little more. It is a $7.99 price tag. But I, I like the premise of this. So this is set in a world that might be ours in like the far future, but not futuristic. You know, mm -hmm. like like we lost our technology. Yeah. And so everything's, it's not like Stone Age or anything. But um, it is set in this weird world where there is no color. Okay. Now it's not in throughout the whole world, but it, it is in the um, city that we're we, we start in so the city has no color and we learn about its history they're kind of doing a um reenactment of, of sorts where they had a revolution against somebody they call the king of colors and this king of colors is billed as being a very bad person and they have a revolution and they seceded from from that society and now they're living in this colorless world Okay, well, you're following this boy, and he doesn't quite believe the stories, especially when a girl shows up who has colored eyes. And he secretly makes friends with her, and he hides her, and they have a plan to sort of run away to go see the colored world for themselves. Um, that is the, the, that's the smallest I can say about this book, because there is a lot going on in it. It actually took me, you know, more than twice as long to read as most of the other comics, but not because it was slow, not because it was dry. Um, there's, this is a big world that's getting painted out here. And I have to say, that's a strong premise. You know, people who are in a colorless world fighting with the world of color. There's a part where uh, the people who don't know about color, some of them are in this party heading towards where the colored world is. And somebody who's seen the colors is trying to describe what it is to people who've never seen it. It's very complicated. Re really interesting. I mean, that's the sort of stuff I like. The art is incredible. Uh, this is a really cool, unified, single vision work by a, a great um, artist. So that's what's going on in Chroma Number 1. If you like um, some ambitious indie stuff, I would check this one out for sure. We just have one variant on it. This is the Heron variant for chroma number one. Oh, uh, actually we also have i forgot the one in ten variant for fifteen dollars okay next up for me is one i don't have a whole lot to say about because i feel like you kind of got to have been reading all of these to fully understand it but this is uh peach momoko's demon wars shield of justice so you can see kind of our captain america like a character in here. This is continuing our Demon Wars story. Um, so if you've been reading them, you'll want to jump on this one. It's not a really a jumping on point because this is continuing what kind of feels like the Demon Wars version of Civil War as we meet more of the cast, the kind of Black Panther character, Spider-Man, all of those. So just a reminder, uh, to let your store know if you're continuing to enjoy the Demon War stuff, jump on board with this one because this is the natural next place it goes, even though it's a number one. Um, this is, of course, our Peach Momoko A cover for that. We have the Peach Momoko B cover with our spider character. We have our Gear Hero variant. Very cool. We have our Nick Dragota variant with our Panther character. We have our, speaking of, James Heron variant. And we have a 1 in 25 Nick Klein variant that we're selling to our customers for $25. All right, so I read Flash issue number 788. 
So check out the cover there. We have the newly elected elected mayor, Gregory Wolf, and behind him is all of the rogues. And the reason is, is because this new mayor, who has a very mysterious sort of uh, plan for the city, he deputizes the rogues to stop all super crimes and superheroes in the city. You get the sense that really he's after Flash. I'll say that. I mean, when you hire the rogues. So, um, you know, it's this book always has a good bit of humor to it as well. Like when Flash runs into Mr. Freeze, who, you know, is like, hey, I'm actually part of the law now. Flash just laughs his butt off. He's just like, what? No way. Um, on top of that, there's some big news for Wally West family in this that you'll have to read. Some, some very big news on that end. It kind of explains how Linda has had powers for a little while. And when I read mm. it, I was like, oh, actually, that does make some sense. Uh, and let's see, what else is going on in it? Oh, yeah, and what about Heatwave? Heatwave is a member of the Rogues, but didn't he and Flash sort of become good friends? If you can remember back mm -hmm. many, many arcs, that is explored in this, and things are not as simple as uh, they were when, when we last saw Heatwave. So another very good issue of Flash. This is one series we we don't really ever lose readers from. Like everyone yeah. just really enjoys this book here. It's like we gain a new reader here and there. But I, every time I see our numbers, I'm like, yeah, a lot of people around here reading Flash every <laughs> time. So um, and it's it's by this this the usual team: Jeremy Adams and Fernando Pissarin. We just have this one odd knock '90s variant. Need I even say '90s variant? Tony Hawk would be proud. <laughs> okay, and for me, I've got Batman Superman World's Finest number nine. So, and who is that on the cover? It is Joker, and we're at the point of view of our uh, newest addition to this series, Boy Thunder. So in this, uh, of course, it's written by Mark Way. The art is by uh, Dan Mora, and I believe... Uh, Bonnevillian does a little bit of it as well. But, uh, Boy Thunder, who is, for all intents and purposes, um, Superman's sidekick. Batman has Robin, but Batman still wants to show him the ropes in Gotham. And he even kind of explains what's the difference between Gotham and Metropolis. And it's, it's pretty accurate of, uh, you know, what the citizens think of Superman, what the citizens think of uh, Batman, and what types of villains they have. Uh, but, you know, basically ends with Batman being like, mine is darker. Mine is mine is a little seedier. Um, but going on in the background, we have Joker, who has teamed up with The Key, who has kind of been the villain in the background of this, this whole arc. Uh, and they have a big plan that's going to be revealed at the end of this uh, of this issue. Um, and you get a lot of fun stuff, like you have Superman going to uh, Barry Allen for advice about a sidekick. And Barry's like, well, you have Supergirl. And he's like, yeah, but when she came here, she was already an adult and all of this. Uh, he wants advice on how to raise or like how to have his own sidekick. It's really fun. It makes the heroes very personable and down to earth. Um, but we do find out I mean, no surprise. I feel like this is not a spoiler at all. There is a dark origin to Boy Thunder. There, you know, it, it can't all be just perfect all the way around. Uh, and it's not it's not something that will really... Uh, it's not like he has a sinister turn. It's just that his origin uh, has some stuff that he kind of feels guilty about. Um, so you kind of get more of his origin in this. And then... Uh, you see how he works with the Teen Titans, which is really good, and how he's maybe has issues controlling his powers. But a the end of this issue is a pretty big, shocking moment that uh, it's one of those like you got to read the next one uh, to find out what's going to happen. It's Mark Wade is crafting such a great series here. So uh, another fantastic issue of World's Finest. We also have this variant. This is the uh, Fox Fuchio variant. Very 90s. Uh, looks like they got a hold of some of the same stuff the Spawn's capes made out of. The capes are turning over. The capes are the heroes. Yes, they are. They're wearing heroes, but the capes are the heroes. Okay, so I read the newest 
book by Colin Bunn. It is Door to Door, Night by Night, with art by Sally Cantorino. And so the premise for this, you see the characters up at the top, it is a bunch of door-to-door -door salesmen, and they run into this girl who just seems like troubled, and they invite her to become a part of their door-to-door -door salesman team. And it turns out that she is a demon hunter. <laughs> and so, yeah, they end up um, embroiled in that with her. She's fighting a demon. And uh, these characters, a lot of the book is spent on who are these salesmen, who would be the types of people who go out every day, door-to-door, get this money and then after work they all drink until they have no more money and then they do it every single day it's a lot of troubled people so each one of them is pretty different and uh they kind of stumble upon her fighting a demon they have to throw in you get to see what they can do what they can't do you know definitely a very a very strange team up that's the premise for this book and it seems like there's going to be more of that like this is sort of you meet everybody you get to see them fight a demon and now where's it going to go from here Probably more of that. So uh, that's the general premise. I, I can't say that it, it would be almost impossible not to um, compare us a little bit to Something's Killing the Children, just with the girl who goes around hunting and killing demons. Yeah. But that's about where it ends. It's a little bit more humorous. Some of the humor is dark humor, you know, sort of thing where somebody's like, hey, throw me a knife. And they try to catch it and it goes through their hand, you know. And right, you're supposed to laugh at yeah, that, you know. Yeah. So that that is sort of the premise for that. Here we have some variants. Here is the hurt variant. Then we have this one in five anger variant we're selling to our customers for $10. And there's a one in 10 Shehan variant we're selling to our customers for $15. Okay, and then I've got She Hulk number eight. So I've really been enjoying the series, but this is a very different issue because I will say that She-Hulk does not appear like physically in this issue. Uh, you see her on pictures, you see her on little news clippings and stuff, but She-Hulk is not in it because we are getting the origin of the people who attacked her in the previous issue who seem to be the uh, the villains for this entire thing that were teased way earlier in one, uh, an early issue where we thought they were okay people. But this is the story of uh, Mark Booth and April Booth, both scientists, but uh, they really want to be Hulk. And they will, they they think, well, if you're a Hulk, you know, you've got the best of, of both worlds. You know, you're a superhero, but you don't have some of the same problems that, you know, some of the other superheroes have. I don't know why they think this about, it seems like that would be one of the worst, but they want to be, uh, you know, they want to be able to change between human and uh, big brutish monsters. So they go through everything they can to try and do that. But of course it does not go well. And they now have a vendetta against Hulks and especially they're going after She-Hulk. Um, you'll have to read it to see all the nuances. It's it's kind of a messed up relationship of where they're both just kind of enabling each other when clearly this is a bad idea. But it looks like we're going to get more of the confrontation between She-Hulk and them in the next issue. So it's still a good uh, installment of She-Hulk, just building up some of our other characters. And we've got some variants for this. This is the Nettie's variant course Howard the Duck who does not appear in this and we have the Dowling variant okay so I read Captain America Winter Soldier special so the first thing to say in this is Captain America is really not in this this is definitely about Winter Soldier which you know even though he doesn't have top billing he has most important billing on mm -hmm. this cover this is very much a deep addendum to Captain America Sentinel of Liberty. Mm -hmm. So if you're reading that series, you're going to pick this up. It's important. If you're not reading that series, you're going to be a little bit lost, okay? Because this is the history of the Outer Circle. The Outer Circle is a group that Captain America has discovered, has been secretly pulling the world's strings um, in Sentinel of Liberty. Well, this, you get to see the original grouping, where, who they are, where they came from, why they're doing it, and how they play this sort of uh, nationalistic game that they're playing that affects the entire world. Uh, so 
I, I thought it was good. It was a very good origin for this group, but you also get to see how Bucky Barnes is trying to fit in it. As much as he's trying to destroy it, in a way, that might fit in with their game. Mm -hmm. So, um, being that I've been reading Sentinel of Liberty, this was a great read for me. But at the same time, I was like, wow, they should have just made this an issue of Sentinel. Yeah. Because this does not stand out on its own. Uh, so, good issue, but you probably want to read Sentinel of Liberty before reading it. That's why we're here, is for this kind of information. <laughs> Correct, yeah. Uh, and, of course, it's done by uh, Jackson Lenzig is the writer, and Colin Kelly does the art. We have the variants. Here is the Carnero variant. Now, does he have that new suit in this, that new look? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And here is the Maliv variant. Okay, next up for me, I have Harley Quinn, the animated series Legion of Bats. Uh, this is number two. And you know what to expect from this. This is uh, just the same crazy, irreverent, uh, sweary, everything of the Harley Quinn animated series. But in this one, uh, Poison Ivy and Harley are going to go to the mall to shop for new outfits. Uh, mostly for Ivy because she has to uh, interview for the position of the leader of the Legion of Doom. And so you get a lot of the classic, like trying on outfits and they're funny and all that but uh of course also things in the mall go kind of haywire for them uh it was another fun issue uh, but you know what to expect from it but letting you know it's out and i don't think there was a regular variant for it or if it, there was we are out of it okay so i read the latest issue of catwoman issue number 49 and so here is the takeaway from this. And, you know, this is why I featured it. Punchline is actually not in this issue. Okay. I know some people who um, have been buying everything Punchline from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So if you want it for the cover, that's great. Now the Royal Flush Gang kind of ends. Like Catwoman's basically starting to step on toes that are going to lead her to Punchline. But Punchline is not even in one panel this issue. So don't buy it for that reason. Unless you just want to know what is going to lead Catwoman towards Punchline. Maybe she'll be in next issue. So I just wanted to show that off. Plus there's some variants I wanted to show from it. Here is the Ballant 1990s variant. Love it. It's a great suit. And then we have the Sozumaki variant. Wow. Yeah, the variants make you think that they're really going to throw down in that yeah. issue but yeah no not yet not yet okay and for me i've got let's see uh we've got a double feature here we've got han solo and chewbacca this is number seven we're continuing where uh chewbacca is in jail and han has been dropped off on a, a backwater planet where he finds out through a news feed that chewbacca is sentenced to death and so he's going to try a rescue attempt uh, while Chewbacca in the prison, along with Maz Kanata, are going to try and break out by themselves. There's uh, some fun cameos in here. Nothing huge, but if you, it's one of those, if you know who the characters are, you're not going to chuckle out of it. So another fun issue of that. Nothing huge happening in there. We've got some variants for that. This is the... Really just sad and lonely Greedo <laughs> variant by Pascal Ferry. And we have the Kerr and Clark variant with these that look like uh, like movie posters. Really cool. I look kind of like a shirt of just a forlorn, forlorn Greedo just in there with the coffee. Yep. And then uh, the yeah. other thing that we have is Star Wars Dr. Afra. This is Afra number 26. This is uh, still continuing that uh, storyline where she's possessed by the Sith artifact. Uh, it looks like it's going to come to kind of a head in the next issue. Uh, it's really building up to something. And we've got the variant for this. This is the Ganachu variant. And we have the Curran Clark variant for this one as well. Okay, so um, I didn't completely read this. I had to <laughs> stop because it was time for our show. We had a busy day here. A lot of people bringing in uh, collections and such. We had to view as well. 
But uh, Rogue State number one is out this week from Black Mass Comics. It is from uh, writer Matteo Pizzolo with art from AC Granda. And so the general premise of this is after a disputed election here in the U.S., there is just uh, the streets erupt into violence. And it's so bad that the police and National Guard combined cannot stop it. And so um, because the police and National Guard just have their hands full, a lot of crime begins. Well, militia groups start popping up, some of them to stop the crime, others in the guise that they're stopping crime, but really they're not doing good things. Well, the Supreme Court actually does a ruling and says, you know what? We need the help. Militia groups are okay. So basically deputizing all militia groups everywhere in the country. Well, that is the premise of Rogue State. You were starting right then and there. Things are bad. Uh, that, that's what I'll say. The, the things are bad. It's a pretty violent book. I was about halfway through it, so that's about all I'll say. Um, but that's that's the premise. You get to see sort of these this one group trying to get into this building, trying to help people. But are they? Are they not? Another group sort of intervenes. So that's generally what's going on in that. And the last thing I had to show is... Um, it is the third week of Bad Idea Comics coming out. This is Orc Island number three. So Orc Island number three is out if you were into the Bad Idea Comics. Just wanted you to know that. Sounds been weekly. Yes, uh, it sure has. So is that it? That's all I got. Okay, so there you have it. That is 24 comics coming out this week and their variants and their incentives. Thank you very much for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. That way you don't miss our upcoming videos. Videos like this and videos like uh, Comics from the Future, which we do every Friday. So I guess that's it. I hope uh, when you come in your comic store, you are not as overwhelmed <laughs> with all the number ones and you know better what is going on in these books now. We take that overwhelming for you when we look at what's coming out and we go, uh-oh. Yeah. All right, so thank you, and we will see you this Friday when we do Comics from the Future. Have a great